Join us, friends. Great Scott, spa guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, spa guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is time for Wickwam. I am the spa guy. I'm globe trotting with trade. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey. So, Trey, you sound a little bit hoarse, buddy. Yeah, I've been sick for the last, what, week and a half, I guess. Yeah. I uh, flew all You the look way. a little wider than normal. Yeah. I can't help it. It's just uh, it's the the sun today. Yeah. And uh, on, a recent, dust here. on a recent episode, we were talking about uh, playing in a band. It was the one with Rob Moss. And we were talking about playing in a band that I played bands in North Carolina. And I mentioned that I had a, um, a mullet at that time. And some people were asking to see the mullet. I could not find a picture to save my life. This right here is me with the whole band. That right there would be, uh, well, with most of the people you could see in the band, that's Wes Rivenbark. Yeah. Uh, Chris, um, uh, come on, Billy. I can't even think of Chris's name. That's Terry Norris on the drums. And I don't know why I can't think of Chris's name. He's one of the best guitar players I ever played with. And I'll zoom in um, so you can see the old mullet. <laughs> That's a mullet, huh? That's country hair in the late 80s, early 90s for sure. Yeah. And um and uh I forgive me, Chris, for I man, I, for some reason I'm just drawing a, a complete blank. Uh, but hopefully I'll I'll undraw that blank here as we move. And uh another person that we had in the band was a guy named Jimmy Corns on on keyboard. You can't see him in that photo. Um, but uh it was a lot of fun playing in that band. They were really, really good, good players. Um, I was proud to play in that band with those guys. It was a lot of fun, but this episode is not going to be about me playing in a band. I just wanted to share that for some people that missed it in the last episode. We wanted to go ahead and get that out up front. And something that we want to talk about more is we originally were talking about the seventies and eighties. We did two episodes on the seventies and eighties. And I brought out things that I could remember um, from those times. And Trey mentioned that we should continue that and maybe maybe even talk about 80s and 90s. So let's say 70s, 80s, and 90s, things that come to mind. And Trey, you said that you wanted you had some questions you wanted to ask me about those times. <laughs> yeah, so going back to the 70s, what what is the difference from the 70s and today? What stands out to you? Uh, well, there's a lot of differences. Um, one thing is, um, I mean, very specific things. Of course, there was no cell phones in the 70s. You had basically four TV channels, or that's what we had. We had three um, regular channels, and then we had one UHF channel, which would have been, you probably don't even know what UHF is. And uh, UHF is kind of like AM on a, on a radio. So okay. you had um, the regular channels, 7, 9, and 12 in North Carolina. And then we had channel 25 um, on channel, it's basically channel 25 on the UHF side, if I'm remembering that right. And they would say something like, uh, you are listening to channel 25 from Greenville, like that. Another thing that would happen back then is you would go into speaking of TV, is there was a time at night where the TV would go blank and it would show the color bars. Um, that the technicians, TV technicians would use to adjust the color on the television. And what it was, was different colors and bars and stuff. And a lot of times it would just emit a sound. It would go, and I will try to imitate the sound. It would go. And that's all it would do. The whole night. The whole night. From then till the next morning. And what would happen is if you had the TV on and you fell asleep, you'd wake up to that sound. Oh, that'd be scary. And I bet you a lot of people that are listening to this, that happened to them. And it may have been a little higher pitch than what I was doing, but it was somewhere along in there. Um, and that was that was just one little piece. We had no, uh, there was no computers um, to speak of. Now, I shouldn't say that. They had, IBM had things out. And I even got for Christmas one year, I got a Casio co computer. 
And this is how uh, antiquated it was. When I say it was a computer, it was a box about this big that had, had the QWERTY keyboard on it. Or it had a keyboard. It may not have been QWERTY. But it was it was letters and numbers. And it was push button like um, like if you've ever had a car that has those door locks that you have to push the buttons to, to unlock the code. Or a hot tub. The way the buttons push on a hot tub, that's the way the buttons pushed on this. So you really couldn't type with it. You had to go and hit it hard. And I remember I wanted it to have extra RAM and my mom bought it for me. And it had a thing that plugged into the back of it that had RAM on it. And what the, what do you guess the computer screen was? Like what size it was or Your, what, what it was. Oh, I don't know. Um, this is going to blow your mind. You had to hook it to your television. Yep, it played on your television. That's there was no there was no screen. It was literally this big, and it had the thing on the back of it. And I wish that I would have taken to it more. And basically, what it did was it came with a book, and you could program it. You could put in language, and at the end of it, hit enter, and the language would print. Or I didn't have a printer, but if you had a printer, you could print it, or the language would put up. Like, let's say that you wanted the shape of a dinosaur with the letter D. It would take the letter D and make the shape of a dinosaur with okay. all these lines of code. So you were basically learning lines of code. This is way before HTML, way before anything that we're used to on a computer. Basically, what it would do is there was an adapter and you would plug it in like a cable adapter and you would hook it to your television, turn it to channel probably two or one, maybe two. And it would literally play through your TV. And back then, we also had it when you had like the Asteroids game. You had this thing that you would hook. There was two screws on the back of your TV that an antenna hooked to with little um, uh, what I would call uh, a, uh, a fork type connector. You know, it was like a, like this and it would fit over the screw and you tighten it up and that hooked to your antenna. And they had this box that you could put on there that had a slider on it. So you slide it one direction to have the antenna. You slide it the other direction for the game to play through the TV. And man, we're talking about <laughs> the, the the difference of electronics today oh, and electronics back then is just night and day. And, uh, you know, when I think of the 70s, we, I always think of people that didn't make it past the 70s and Elvis being one. What would he have had today from a standpoint of electronics, he would have had the best TVs, the best of, of everything, of course. Rolls. Yeah. But Elvis had a TV in or a, a, a telephone in his car in 1958. Mm. Um, Rex told me that when they were coming back from basic, when they were coming back from Texas, that when they got to West Memphis, he let him make a phone call to tell the people, you remember we went to that house and filmed, that's the same day we found the ambulance way back. And he called those people to let them know that he was going to be meeting them there and to let people know to come there. And he called from a, from a, a car phone in the Continental. Wow. In the 56 Continental Mark II. Yeah. 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 1958. <laughs> no one had that back then. No. You know. No um, another thing that happened in the 70s we didn't touch on was I remember – during the Jimmy Carter era, um, gas shortages being so huge that the only way you could get gas in your car was based off of the first letter in, or first number in your uh, license plate. So odd was one day, even was the next day. So if you were out of gas and you had an odd uh, license plate number, then you were stuck till the next day. What? And people would literally wait in line. Yeah, that's a fact. That happened. How much was gas prices? Uh, it, they were, I'm going to say that gas in that time was probably 50 or 60 cent would be my guess. Wow. But there was a shortage of fuel. Um, also, the interest rate was crazy back then. You remember uh, that double wide that Elvis bought. And this is not an Elvis podcast, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm just going to compare it to uh, a couple of things that I know about from Elvis. When he bought that double wide, his interest rate was 13%. The uh, the trailer was $20,000, $19,999. He paid $3,000 down, so he financed $17,000 for 10 years. If he would have paid back the loan over the course of 10 years, he would have paid back $44,000 on a $17,000 loan. And he was going to do that. 
Well, he wasn't planning on doing that. Vernon paid it off. But my point is, is the interest rate at 13% was untenable. Most people couldn't afford to even buy anything. And if you did, it was, you know, the interest rate was just outrageous. Now uh, we were down in 3%. You know, now it's up a little bit. Was it seven now? Something like that. But seven compared to 13 is still wonderful. It's gone over 10 too. Recently? Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't think it went over 10. But they say it's going to drop back down. And when they do, there's going to be some crazy stuff that goes on. Um, other things that I could think of from the 70s was um, that's that's when a lot of bands came out. ACDC, Led Zeppelin, you know, MTV. We didn't talk about MTV. And that's, that's a, a, a good subject. I remember when the first day that MTV aired, I remember watching it. I was a teenager. I was in high school. And the very first video was a, uh, a video called Video, uh, video Killed the Radio Star. The name of the band was the, I want to say Boggles, but I don't, that's not, I don't think that's right. Um, uh, but the name of the song was Video Killed the Radio Star. And when it first started, we started watching these videos of these bands because for the most part before that, um, and I'm going to look up Video Killed the Radio Star real quick, but prior to that, you really didn't, um, for the most part, you didn't know what a band looked like. A lot of the bands never put pictures of themselves on the on the record. So you, you didn't, um, it is the Buggles, I was right. And um, I, I, it didn't sound right, but maybe did I say Boggle? It's Buggle. You said Boggle. Um, and uh, so it's the Buggles. But uh, when that started, bands like Journey, ACDC, the Greg Ken band, um, which would be um, Greg Ken did. Um, you probably never heard of the Greg Ken band. He had uh, a song that would otherwise I would have never even known what it was. And um, let's see, it was the Greg Ken and the Greg Ken band. Their, their big song was um, I'm looking at the discography now so I can remember, but their big song was well, he's figuring it out guys. Jeopardy. Jeopardy. Yep. Um, and that's the song that I remember. It's saying Jeopardy went to number two in 1983. Okay. Um, so when I'm talking about MTV, I think it started around 1980 would be my guess. And it may have been 79. So, um, but that, so that was the very first music video on television. Yes. Yeah. That I'm aware of. Yeah. It started actually in 81. So it started a little later than I thought. It says August the 1st of 81. But what it did for all of these groups is suddenly you're getting a visual of these groups. And the visual opens up a whole new thing for uh, as a fan of things. So I can remember seeing John Cougar on there. In fact, he was called John Cougar at the time. The first time I ever saw him, he was John, uh, John Cougar. And then he changed it to John Cougar Mellencamp. And then he dropped the Cougar and made it John Mellencamp. Oh, okay. Someone told him that he needed to be, Mellencamp wasn't going to work. Right, so right, he needed right. to do something else. So you had that and you had the Dexys Midnight uh, Riders. Um, and their song was, um, uh, boy, I'm really, really struggling with these songs tonight. Their song was, and I bet you there's people screaming at the radio right now. <laughs> Try um, Dexys Midnight Riders, Come On Eileen was the name of that song. I and then know. you you had uh, the men at work from Australia. They popped up, and it made all these. Tom Petty is the first time I ever saw Tom Petty was on MTV. But it made all of these bands very, very, very famous to the point where a lot of them are still playing today because of MTV, <laughs> because it it solidified them as as stars to people right. my age. Right. Got to fix that. Yeah, my lighting will get better. Yeah, the lighting's a little better there, a lot better. <clears throat> but it was just a different time, and that was 80s. Um, another uh, thing is uh, vehicles back then. You know, my first car was a Camaro, a 76 Camaro. 
which would have been about 1980. And that car used was only twenty seven hundred dollars. How think. much? Twenty seven hundred. Wow. Yeah, and it, it was only four years old. What color? It was black with a red and white stripe. It had the uh, back then we called the tires on them. Um, it had they called them sixties. Yeah. Uh, but now what's funny is you'll hear people talk about tires and go, "Well, I got fifties, or I got sixties, or I got seventies on my on my car." Mm -hmm. So this is a little aside. For people that don't know what that means, that it's actually not correct. Um, that they were saying it like that made the tires wider. Actually, what it means is if you look at your tire and it says like P225 slash 70 R15, what that means is the the height of the tire is 70% of the width. So the width is 225. The height is 70% of 225. Oh, okay. Right? Right. And uh, and then the last number, the 15, is the rim size, the bead size. Huh. Yeah. That's just a little aside for, for you people that uh, I worked in the car business for a little while. Um, and actually for a lot of while, about 20 years. And um, I just thought that so the first time I learned that, I was like, what? What, what, what do people talk about 50s or 60s on their car? You went on engines and stuff, didn't you? Do what? You worked on car engines? Yeah, well, I was a service manager at a Ford dealership. I worked there almost my whole adult life. And then I opened a company in Nashville with another company called The Engine Store. And we re installed, rebuilt truck, car and truck engines. Um, so I worked in that business a long time. Um, I wouldn't want to do it again. The, co the cars are so complicated today that it's that it's crazy. Yeah. And I still piddle with cars because I I enjoy piddle, piddling with my cars. Well, and, I saw, um, I've seen one that you have back there. Yeah, I've got a few. Yeah. It's going to be cool once you get that fixed. Yeah. And something that I've been doing is if I do a repair on the car, I'll film it and put it on my how-to channel. It doesn't show up on any of these channels, but it'll be over there on the Spy Guy how-to channel. Like I fixed the horn button on my Porsche and I used hot tub parts to fix it. So I sell yeah. a little kit that you can buy for people that need that same thing. So I sell a lot of those kits, believe it or not. And it's just hot tub parts. That's and, cool. uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm restoring a 57 continental Mark II is what you're talking about. Like Elvis had, um, some other things that I could think of from that time. And while, while we're going, I'll be thinking of some more questions. Okay. Um, you know, I got married in 1987 and I bought my first, new car in 1988 it was a thunderbird turbo coupe thunderbird okay i like the bird and i paid 19,000 seemed like it was 19,300 it's the most i'd ever paid for a vehicle even you know i'm, I'm saying that's my first new i bought used but it was the most i ever paid for a vehicle my payment was 406 a month and that was outrageous for a car payment my car payment on the car before that one was 186 so what were you thinking every month with that 400 and well, I was making enough money to pay for it. You know, I was working at the dealership I bought the car from. Um, uh, but I love that car. It was I called it the silver bullet because it was silver, had the uh black trim down the middle with the little red stripes, it had the beautiful aluminum wheels on it. It had a 2300 Pinto engine, um, a four cylinder with the turbo on it. Oh, okay. and it was pretty fast. It would it would go pretty good. What and happened? I actually wrecked that car coming back from um, the race in North Wilkesboro. It was in the rain and I lost control of it and it hit the guardrails and took the front end off. Oh. And um, I got it fixed, but um, it never was really right again after I got it fixed. And I had another one. I had a white one too with, uh, with blue interior. This one was gray with dark gray interior, but that was my first new car. And I paid back, seemed like I borrowed, um, I paid back $27,000 on that car and my loan was um what the car was 193 so my loan was 193 I think I put a thousand down and ended up paying 27,000 total money after interest at that time yeah and that's weird how those numbers stick out to me but that was a long time ago well that was your first big purchase like you just said like you're like i can't believe i'm paying 19 grand for a yeah and it, it was july the 4th that i bought that 1988 and that week i took off and drove to graceland my very first time that was our first trip to graceland 
That was the first trip in that in, in that car. Mm -hmm. I just bought the car. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Where'd you you remember where you stayed at? I know how different it is. You know, I don't. Um, I, I remember being, I, you know, I know we stayed in a hotel, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I, were, I could see myself in the room talking to Lori, Yeah, but I can't, I can't yeah. visualize where it was. <laughs> it, it may have even been the, um, uh, holiday in, not the holiday in, but the, the one that Elvis's guys would always stay at the, uh, orange roof. What was that? Howard Johnson's Howard Johnson's. It may have been the Howard Johnson's because it was right down the street. Yeah. I don't remember it being far away, um, but to drive that, to give you an example, to drive that today would take you from where I lived in North Carolina to um, to Nashville yeah. is about nine hours, between nine and 10 hours. And then from Nashville to Memphis is about three to three and a half hours. So if you figure that's about, that's 12 and a half to 13 and a half hours. Back then it was 17 hours because yeah, you couldn't, you didn't run over 55. You'd run 60, but that's it. And uh, they gave tickets out like candy back then. And that's another real big thing um, from that era. And that is um, getting tickets. Now, man, I see people driving like fools everywhere and nobody, and they never get stopped back then. And I'm not proud of what I'm getting ready to tell you, but it's a true story. When I moved to Nashville, I was 35 years old. So if you take 35 and you set you back it up to 16, yeah, that's uh, what 19 years of driving, right? In 19 years of driving, I had 38 tickets. Had 38? 38 <laughs> tickets. So when I'm telling you they passed out tickets, they passed out tickets. You and I, I would go from the I would go the back way from Lagrange, North Carolina to go to Greenville, the back way. And I'm talking about out in the country, nothing out there and get a ticket. I'd run up on a highway patrolman and they would be clocking as they're driving down the road, not just sitting on the side of the road, waiting for people like they do now, you know, and uh, they just don't give tickets. And especially in Tennessee, when I first moved here, you could get a ticket pretty easily. Now you rarely see the highway patrol pull anybody over rarely. Yeah. Yeah, I was just in Denver last week. I I don't even know if I even saw a cop. Yeah, Except I had to go and file a police report. I saw maybe a cop then. Also stopped in there and filmed an Elvis related story at one of the police departments. They have a plaque. Uh, it's on my episode of Globe Trotting with Trey last week. But uh, I didn't see no uh, cops on the roads at all. <laughs> I Man. was because I drove all <laughs> all over the state. Well, that's why you get these people that go out there and drive crazy. And I drive a little fast sometime, but I don't drive as fast as I used to all the time, you know. Um, and you just, especially in Memphis, boy, they're just, they're weaving and doing all kind of craziness. Yeah. yeah very, and you, very dangerous. Then you got pulled over for uh, for a um, <laughs> your license plate. Yeah, for a dead tag on a brand new truck. Yep. I'd had the truck two months. I didn't know that the tag was dead. That yeah. we moved from my old truck to the new one. I didn't think about it. Yeah. And uh, that's that's on me. But it, that cost me, what, $150, something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't have to come back to Memphis and appear. Um, <laughs> so what else? Where were you born? <laughs> 1987. Okay. So you were you were living in the, in the 80s and 90s. What is different about the 90s to you than now? I... Well, I see it as a kid, I guess, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. but it just seems like it was a different, to me, it seems like a different world. <laughs> um, it is. School was different because I was able to see, you know, I was able to be around <coughs> high school age too because of my dad uh, coaching basketball. So I was always around older people. Um that was something that stands out. Like when I got older, it just seems like my, you know, me and my friends, we didn't look as old as people in the nineties looked in high school. I yeah. don't know. If that's just because of the age difference and you're looking, you know, through younger eyes. Um, but school was different. Um, rules were different. Uh, Did you get paddled in school? Yes. 
like in elementary, like probably second grade. But not in high school? I always taught a lot. So I got in trouble a lot in elementary school for talking. And then we'd have substitute teachers. And me and my friend, we'd try to see who could get the most check marks because they'd put your name, they put everybody's name on the board that was acting up. Then you'd put, they'd put a check beside your name and two mm-hmm. checks, 10 checks. And so, yeah, me and my, I remember one day uh, we probably had about an eight a piece. So it probably was not good when the teacher came back. <laughs> the following week. Um, Did I'm you gonna, ever go up there and try to erase one? <laughs> do, uh, um, no, I don't think I ever did that. Um, one it's time right I, out there in the open, man, I'm going to slip in there and erase one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I remember standing in the, you know, we were talking about this other day, how dumb you were when you're little, like you would actually listen to an adult tell you to stand in a corner with your nose in the corner. And, and you would literally stand there during the class. Yeah, well, it's called respect. Yeah, respect but I was just thinking, like, we, we, we really did that. We stood in a quarter. Yeah, because and- you didn't want to get in trouble. Because when you go home and they tell uh, mom and daddy what you did, you're going to get it there, right? That's right. <laughs> and for That's me, right. when if I messed up at school, I didn't want my daddy to know that I got a, pa- a paddling at school because he yeah. would get me again. I remember, let's see, in the 90s, I guess it would probably have been 99. When did uh when did um the world go crazy over Harry Potter? Man, I don't know. Yeah, you don't remember? I have no I, I remember, remember I, the I was an adult at that time. I wasn't paying attention <laughs> the to that. Book stuff. Came out and uh it was a big deal, the book. Yeah, just look it up. And but anyway, it was my sixth grade class. I remember my teacher uh they gave us an opportunity. She would read like a chapter or two every day out of this book. Mm-hmm. So it lasted the entire year. And she gave us, a, we could either listen to the to her or we could take a nap. Of course, I took a nap during that that uh, <laughs> that hour, I guess. The movies came out in 2001. Yeah, so it was 98, 99. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah, but the 90s, though, I mean, it was just a fun time to grow up, really. Uh, uh, N64 became big, and we would stay in all summer and play Golden Eye, James Bond, 007. And uh, I remember we had neighbors that would come up to our house where we lived, and and we'd play all day long and go swimming. Summers were, I guess, better. <laughs> you know, uh, you just had fun. You had fun, but you were an adult then, so you're struggling making your four hundred dollar car for yeah. four hundred fifty dollar car payment. Yeah. I'm playing N64 and Golden I just having the time of my life. Yeah. <laughs> I was playing in bands in in the late 90s. I was playing in bands. I was playing a lot every weekend. Oh, really? So you're playing. Oh, okay. no. so you're tra- probably in the summertime. You're traveling around. Or yeah, I started playing in bands in uh, that we talked about before. I was 15. So I was 15 in, um, in 19, 1985. No, 1980, I should say. So wow. I started playing in bands in about 1980. And by the time um, I, I switched from, from rock and roll to country, and I think I may have mentioned this before, about 1988-ish, 89, that's when Garth came out and all these different things. That's, that's when country, it went away from rock and roll and went to country in the bars. And so you had all these places that you could play that had two stepping and and all that kind of stuff, ca- cowboy type stuff. Wow! And um, so all that would have been Garth. along that time. You know what? <laughs> all because of Garth. Yeah, well, he's and I say not just him, but but he was a catalyst for a lot of it because he became very big along that time, eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety, somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. And I remember I tell the story about when I went in nineteen eighty eight. We went to Memphis. And I went to Mud Island, and uh, when I stepped up to buy the tickets to Mud Island, the lady asked me if I wanted to see, uh, if I wanted to go to the concert that night. And I said, well, who's playing? She said, George Jones. I said, I'll take two. (laughs) And so we go to hear George Jones at that amphitheater out there on Mud Island. You could see it from the city side of Memphis over, you know, out there in the river, Mississippi River. And um, two opening acts was Lori Morgan and Alan Jackson. I had no idea who either one of them were. And uh, I learned later, of course, because uh, Alan especially became huge. Yeah. 
Didn't you tell him to get off the stage? I did. It's like, guys, I, y'all get off stage. We got to hear the possum. Hey, have, possum you, up have, here. You the, uh, have you seen the Cardi? Is it, is it Cardio B or what the heck's her name? Card- Cardi B. Card, card B. Yeah, Cardi B. Cardi B. All right. So did you see the fan accidentally? It looks like the fan accidentally threw the water. Yeah, threw something at her. Yeah. <laughs> she threw the microphone. But the funny thing is she kept singing. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> he was still singing and the mic had just hit somebody in the stands and her voice just still going, just going as strong as ever. You know, it, just, it just shows how fake they are all, all are today. Yeah. You know? you know, okay. So now if you want to talk about fake, then let's talk about Millie Vanilli. You remember Millie Vanilli? Millie Vanilli. No. What? Okay. All right. So there was this group called Millie Vanilli. It was two black guys and they both had dreads. Very, I, w- I would say, uh, as I would say this as a straight white man, very good looking guys front that you would think to be a front man for a group, right? And what happened is they got caught lip syncing. It turns out that they were not the voices on the record <laughs> at all. And what it was is a bunch of studio guys that got together and made a record and the record is really good. Uh, especially when I was in the car stereo business and I would put the uh, the subwoofers in the vehicles, I used that album as my test tracks for the sub because it had so much sub bass in it and uh, just sounded great. But those guys got caught and, um, and just basically got ousted when they figured out that they couldn't even sing. It, it was so bad, Trey, that a guy felt sorry for them and tried to teach them to sing. And couldn't because their accent was so hard, so heavy. He could not teach them to sing. And uh, they didn't understand the language even. And, and they got ousted. So you've never heard about Millie Vanilli. I'll have to go look them up now. That's funny. Unfortunately for those fellas, now they all are lip singing. <laughs> and that would be MTV that would have made uh, Millie Vanilli famous as well. <laughs> You're talking about the 90s t- today. You know, I was sad. Pee Wee Herman died. Yeah, Pee Wee died. 70 years old. Yeah. And I, you know, that was during when I was a little kid. Yeah. Uh, That's watched, young. Yeah. I watched, oh, I watched, uh, I watched those, you know, his show uh, on Saturday mornings when I was a little kid. I mean, I have vivid memories of uh, Pee Wee Herman on that bicycle and opening of the episode. And it would just like fire you up as a kid. <laughs> I just, you know, it's crazy that he created such a crazy character now that you look at it, but he like, he created something that became like, Huge, yeah, he had a lot of huge movies and everything. <laughs> yeah, but it looked like that uh, Paul Rubin. He looked like he had cancer for uh, for six years. And really, he, I didn't know what it was. He didn't tell anyone. And uh, when he died last night, he I guess had it written where you he had a he had an Instagram tweet that he wanted to tweet out, and he apologized on his post for not letting anyone know. Wow. Yeah, so he had a plan like when he died to post that. I guess with his agent or whoever publishes uh, posted that. Seventy years old. So that that was nineties. I mean, Pee Wee Herman was big in the nineties. Oh, of you know? course he was. Yeah, he he filmed a couple of things here. Um. Well, no, you know what? I'm I'm getting him confused with uh, Jim Varney. Um. Jim Varney was big in the nineties. Yeah, he was. When I first moved to Nashville. He died early. I'm going to say he died the year 2000, early. And when I heard that he had passed away, I wanted to go to the funeral home. And so I told Lori, later. he was in White House. Might have been um, 2006, maybe. No, it was 2000. Uh, no, I had just moved to Nashville. Yep, Jim Varney died in 2000. It was 2000, okay. No, I haven't looked it up yet, but. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was 2000 that, uh, yep, yeah, February 10th, 2000. Oh, okay. So he lived, in, he lived in White House. We'd been here two months. Well, no, we'd been here 40 days when he died. And I told Lori, I said, let's get the kids and load them in the van. I want to go to White House, which is the next town over from where we live, and see, and see Jim Barney. I want to go to the to the funeral home. I couldn't find it. I just moved here. I, I went to White House, but I couldn't find the funeral home. So you were going to go to his funeral? Yeah, I was trying to go to the funeral home, yeah. Oh wow! I wanted to go in there and sign the guest book and all that because he had just passed away. Yeah. And um, but something else I want to talk about that I have very vivid memories of, and now it's kind of even almost gone away on some level, 
And I never, when I saw it and heard about it the first time, I thought, well, this is it. It can't get better than this. And that is compact discs. Do you know where a compact disc was invented? I don't know where a compact, no, I don't know. Um, yeah, wh where was it? Okay, I can tell you. Uh, it was invented in Eindhoven, Holland in the Netherlands oh, okay. by, by a company called Philips. You've seen Philips on TV and it's P-H-I-L-I-P-S, one L, Philips. And yeah. you've even seen Philips Magnavox. At one time, they were joined up and doing things. So they're also um, responsible for a lot of other things. I went to the museums when I, I, I stayed in Eindhoven for several weeks while I was in Europe filming. And uh, went to the uh, Philips. Uh, they have a museum there. I went to all the stuff related to that. And they even claimed that they inv invented the light bulb. So if you go in there, they say they invented the light bulb. They leave Edison completely out of it. Edison gone. But that's in a different country. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, what I thought was interesting, the very first time that I heard about it would have been, I think it came out, I think they came out in 1982. So the first time that I heard about a compact disc would have been about 1983 or maybe 84. And there was a local uh, car stereo store and I ended up working at that car stereo store or for that guy. Um, and, um, and the guitar player, by the way, his name's Chris Williams. It just hit me. Um, <laughs> and Chris lives in Wallace, North Carolina, uh, just outside of Wilmington, very close to where Michael Jordan's father's buried in the next town. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, the compact disc, what I heard people were saying, this guy over at this car stereo store, Rick has got CDs and he, and his big selling point was you could throw them and they wouldn't break. And they wouldn't break. Okay. And they wouldn't break. So he would show you that a record would break, but the compact disc wouldn't break. Yeah. Yeah. So of course I went nuts with the compact disc back then. I worked in the car stereo business. So I actually had in my car in the Thunderbird turbo coupe. I installed a, um, a, a stereo that was called, I had several different ones. The one, my favorite one was called a pig racer. And it actually had pigs that would race across the screen as songs were playing. And it would race based off of how much treble or how much bass was in the song. They would beat each other. Okay. And, uh, and it had a 10 disc CD changer in the trunk. And I had subs in there and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but that's my first recollection of CDs. And then, of course, I went nuts and bought CDs. Now they're they're out. Yeah. Now it's all hard drive stuff, you know. All hard drive now. Yep. The first time I saw that, I was like, man, it can't get better than this. This is crazy. Look at this. I could skip tracks and I can listen again and again and again. And you could put the, when you were traveling, you could put 10 discs in there and it would play. It would, you could even hit random and it would play random tracks off of all 10 discs. Okay, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, you were uh, riding inside all them. Oh man, that was a big deal. And it had a remote that looked like a joystick. You could turn it up and down and change songs and just hold the joystick in your hand. Well, I was listening to Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights on in the car. But uh here's the disc. But uh the car now that I have don't it don't have a Yeah, they did away with it. Player. Yeah. And the thing is, and also, you know, what I've noticed is uh, my iMac here that I'm on doesn't have now a DVD player. Yeah. Where you burn There's DVD a lot on the side. Yeah. So I had to go and buy, a, you know, an external to uh, burn uh, DVDs, you know, for things that I have to do for a client. But my other iMac over here has the DVD. So they, they've taken that out of the new ones. Now these are a lot more expensive than that. They don't even have half the stuff anymore. Yeah. And they make you have to pay for extra stuff now. But I don't even, I have no use for that because most of the, the programs that I would need are on the internet. You just download them now. Yeah. Well, I need, I need to, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, burn stuff sometimes um, to make DVDs and stuff. For oh yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. And stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, can't do it on my, yeah. Right so while we're on that subject, let's talk about uh, computers. I was introduced to computers like they are today, if you will, by a friend of mine that I actually played in a band with. Um, and he was the first guy that I knew of that had a, a nice home computer and he knew how to program it. He, he built websites. 
he did all that stuff. And one day I asked him, I said, uh, um, tell me about, about a computer. I know you're kind of a computer guy. Tell me about it. This would have been about 1987 or 1988. No, I'm telling you wrong. This would have been about 1997, 96, somewhere along in there. Six, 95. 95, 96. And um, I was trying to think of his name. I could see his face. We called him Woody because he looked like Woody from Toy Story. He'd wear a big old cowboy hat when he was playing. He was real skinny. <laughs> Eddie, Eddie Long is, is his name. I, Eddie, I'm sorry. I couldn't think of your name there for a minute, brother. But anyway, I went to him and said, hey, tell me about these computers. And I know you you do websites and program and stuff. Explain that to me. And when he did, it kind of all made sense. And it made me want to go buy a computer. So I went and bought my very first computer. And it was a it was a, a PC. It had a uh, Intel 133, 1.33 processor in it. Had eight megs of RAM, and it had a. I think it had like a one gig hard drive in it, and it was five thousand dollars. <laughs> I know. Yeah, in the mid nineties. I wonder. It, I I remember my mom and dad had a computer, and like my favorite thing to do is because that's what my dad did is they had a minesweeper on there. Yes. With the bums. And yeah. You you didn't want to blow yourself up. And I remember that that would be so fun to play. You yeah. remember, so would you do that, Billy? Yeah, well, I played. There was a lot of games. I actually started. I got it first to do uh, word processing and that kind of stuff. And I would make, uh, I would edit out photographs. Back then, you could buy this program called Microsoft Picture It. And on Microsoft Picture It, um, you... Uh, could edit photos, you could cut out, you could add letters. So I would do that for my band Tied in up. order Thank to... You. Thank you very much. So that means we got three minutes left. Um, but I would do that. I would edit for the band in order to uh, make pictures, flyers, and all that kind of stuff. And then I used it for playing games like you're talking about. And then I used it to record. The very first time I ever heard of that, I went to the music store in Goldsboro, Max Stewart's. And they were telling me about this, this thing that fit in a rack like this. It was rack mount. And you can't see my rack, but the uh, it fit in a rack like you see right here on this. It was rack size. And it was one space. And it was $1,000. I remember that. And I paid for it almost a year before it came out because I wanted to get it as soon as it was released. And so I brought it home, hooked it to my computer, um, hooked it to a board, and I was able to record songs in it and edit it and all that. I couldn't believe it. It was so easy. And now everybody does it, but that was my first taste of it back then. And it was called a Layla and it was by a company called Event. And it came with, um, it came with Adobe Audition was the very first doll. It was the first software I, I had. And it came with that. Adobe Audition became Nuendo, which is a lot higher end. So you got uh, as far as recording, you've got Pro Tools and then you've got New Window or um, what's the higher end New Window? Um, I can't think of it. But anyway, I was able to record on a computer in the late 90s. Well, um, or in the mid 90s, really, because I moved here the, the last day of 1999. So it had to have been years earlier than that. So I built a recording studio behind my house and we would record into it and I'd do live drums and the whole nine yards, but it's so far improved even today as opposed to what it was back then. And, and that computer was able to handle all that? Barely. I remember them talking about, I moved mine to a 200 from a 133 to a 200. And I thought I had something. And I remember them saying, or actually it was a 233. I remember somebody saying they, this is a real thing that I was told by somebody. 333 will never come out. It's too fast. It's illegal. Too fast. Too fast. They say it was illegal. Never happened. And <laughs> what does that even mean? Illegal for what? It's not like the computer's speeding down the road. But that's how urban legends and all that stuff got started back then. Was, wow. But that was the beginning of I mean, that was dial up when you went out wanted to hook yeah, I, remember in, I, remember. I remember in 2000 the dial up. Yeah. You'd, you'd, you'd hear the phone, but 
if all it was, not. it was horrible. Now see. all of my computers stay on all the time and they're always hooked to the internet. I just sit down and hit one of the buttons and it comes on and I go. Well, Come friends, on. go ahead, Trey. Well, I was just going to say the nineties though was a, to me, cause I only did it, but it was a great time as a little kid to grow up because you had all the great cartoons, all the TV shows. I loved, are you afraid of the dark on Nick, yeah. on Nick at nights? Uh, uh, but I was that I was watching those old shows back then too on Nick at Night, like the Andy Griffith show, Lucy, Dick Van Dyke, things like that. But the nineties just I guess it just seems like the the days were just a lot slower than they are now. Yeah. And uh it just seems like everything more, was just a little bit more laid back. And uh but I was a kid, so all this craziness probably was still going yeah. on. I was just didn't care about well, no. this is a fact. I'll leave you with this. The older you get, the faster it gets. And yeah, I know. Right. It does. It's just like that. 